Hey everyone, Christian Brindle here. I hope you enjoy this free audiobook that we're putting together of my new book, Superstar. Superstar is a case study of what it takes to be massively successful as an insurance producer and how to write a lot of business no matter what line of insurance you are focused in. I also encourage you, while you're listening to this, to go down into the description of this video and pick up a paperback or hardcover copy on Amazon of the book as well. There's nothing quite like having a physical copy of a book, and there's nothing quite like going through it and actually reading it. So just because you have the audiobook version does not mean that you can't still enjoy the paperback physical copy. It's a beautiful book. It's beautifully written, and um, I put a lot of time and effort into it to make it great for you. Without further ado, let's just jump right in, and I hope you enjoy the book. Superstar, What Separates Top Producing Insurance Agents from the Mediocre Ones, by Christian Brindle. Forward, by Glenn Shelton, CEO and founder of Hire Heroes and Lead Heroes. When Christian first asked me to write this book forward, I immediately accepted his offer, even though at the time the book had yet to be written. He explained to me that his goal was to explain what separated the average producers from the very best in our industry. A topic that we've discussed at nauseatum detail in our weekly podcast show, Taco Tuesday, Let's Taco About Insurance. As a licensed insurance agent, some of life's biggest questions remain front and center every single day of your career. What happens if I get sick or a family member gets sick? Or even a bigger question, what happens if I or a family member die? When sitting down with a husband or wife, sometimes the entire family, I would see how uncomfortable some of these big life questions could make them feel. Health insurance or life insurance products can remove the financial burden from these unfortunate and oftentimes unforeseen events, but even then, most people would still choose to remain healthy or bring a loved one back to life for the eternity of their net worth. That being said, think about it. How much would you be willing to pay to have one more day with a loved one who is no longer alive? After spending years helping families navigate these big life questions and preparing them to the best of my abilities, I began to understand the true answer to these problems was slightly different. Regardless of which question you ask, health or life, the answer was the same. We all have something that is equally distributed that far exceeds the value of health insurance or life insurance policy that you can purchase. In fact, it's more valuable than any tangible asset or balance in any bank account. Furthermore, how you spend this value determines the outcome of all things pertaining to your life. Time. We all get the same 86,400 seconds per day. You may have heard the cliche that you can view this as a daily deposit hitting your account, $86,400. Now, as a business owner or investor, if I had an annuity payout of $86,400 every single day for the rest of my life, I would be looking to get the highest return on my investment ROI that I could possibly find. I do not need $86,400 per day to live on. I only need a fraction of that to take care of my, my basic needs and the needs of my family. So how would you spend that $80,000 per day? You could buy almost any car you wanted. Save up for a few days and you could buy a Lamborghini or a Maserati. You could wait a few weeks and purchase real estate that you could have never imagined owning before. Maybe that's a beach house or your own private vineyard. Metaphorically, I'm describing minutes as money, but honestly, in my opinion, they are one and the same. Time is money, and money is time. Literally, at Lead Heroes and Hire Heroes, time is money. We provide vetted virtual staffing who can handle low revenue or no revenue generating activities that coveted currency of time, which I believe to be our most valuable asset that we can possess, return to you in a simple scalable format. Declaring myself as your financial time advisor, I highly recommend investing in this book. Christian Brindle has created a combination of life principles, sales training, and more in a condensed, easy-to-read format that I believe insurance agents, both new and skilled, can gain knowledge from. His decade of experience in the senior insurance industry as a producer, agency owner, and now principal of the FMO Field Marketing Organization, Christian Brindle Insurance Services, provides him with a unique view. 
Only a few top producing agents or agency owners that I am aware of have taken their precious time to publish valuable information like this, and typically it is at a significantly higher cost. To all the agents who read this, as I always say, happy selling. Chapter one, what does it mean to be a superstar? The term superstar gets tossed around a lot in our current day and age. The first thing that pops into my head personally when I think about it is professional athletes. As a sports fan, I closely follow a few sports and occasionally listen to some of the talking heads discuss players. One topic that may sound ridiculous, but I always found to be fairly interesting was which players were classified as stars and which ones transcend that to cross into the category of superstar. I must admit, this line of discussion has always been a guilty pleasure of mine, and at times I have listened to countless radio programs, shows, and podcasts discussing the topic. The consensus that seems to come about these lines of conversations, in the sports world anyway, is the following. Number one, the player can't just be good to be a superstar. All the players in the conversation are good at what they do, but they must have an extra characteristic about them that separates them as great in the eyes of the viewer. The way they impact their team, the game, and the sport is just that much more noticeable than the other normal players or even star players around them. Number two, their overall resumes are brought into the conversation early and often. A player's resume speaks to the level of consistency they are able to perform at an extremely high level as well as for the length of time they can maintain said performance. Plenty of players may have a good season or maybe even a good stretch of play, but few can stay at that level for years or even decades. I have always looked at this line of thinking with extreme interest because I see a lot of similarities to the world of performance-based careers like that of insurance sales, and because of this, I guess it's similar to sports. There are certain individuals in our industry that seem to be capable of doing extraordinary things that leave their peers in awe and amazement. A common phrase of how do they do that might come to mind. I have sold insurance for nearly a decade, and over my time, I have encountered a lot of agents. I have seen some that are lazy and uninspired. I've seen some that can hold their own and pay their bills, and I have seen some stone-cold killers. One question people ask me all the time is, Christian, how can I be a top-producing agent? As a multiple top-producing agent in my own right, it's not a simple question to answer because I feel like there are an abundance of factors that go into achieving excellence. Your definition of a superstar producer may be different than mine, but for the sake of this book and driving home the message of what we will need to accomplish and what you'll actually need to do to absolutely crush it selling insurance, we're going to be using my definition. An agent whose production can stand out above that of the masses and can grow companies and organizations around their single efforts. That is my definition. A question I get asked frequently is, can someone be a superstar if they have never been a top producer? My short answer to that is, in almost every situation, no. There are very few exceptions. Now that doesn't mean that someone who has spent many years cranking out applications and takes a step back from personally producing to build their agency in other ways, such as training, marketing, or forming other independent deals and partnerships, aren't a superstar. Far from it. Their individual brilliance allowed them to grow a company around them and remove themselves from needing to write every single application. That is what I call smart and matters more to me than agents I see who have been writing by their own pen for 30 years and have no employees and no support system. Nothing against these types, but that sounds more like they never take the next steps in their organizations and by doing so, they never end up reaching their full potential. What I mean when I say non-producers cannot be considered superstar status is individuals who have never grown a book of business or a clientele, but they participate in an excess of recruiting and training. How would you feel if you spent an hour of your valuable time, which is more valuable than gold, by the way, more on that later, sitting in on a training call only to find out later on that they haven't even done the things they are teaching you? Me personally, I would feel gypped. 
while there are certainly agents out there who have written more business by their own pens than I have, I have been a top producer with various insurance companies every single year I actively focused on writing business. Needless to say, I have written a lot of policies and I have written more than probably 99% of insurance agents ever will. I don't say any of this to impress you, but to impress upon you that the information I'm going to be presenting to you in this book comes from a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, as well as working hands-on with others and, and thousands of actual agents, to be, to be honest with you, during my career in some form or fashion. I've seen single agents outproduce small teams and entire organizations simply by doing much of what is laid out in the chapters to come. To me, superstar status agents are what keep our industry of the insurance agent distribution going. It is the 10 to 20% of producers that result in 80 to 90% of the production that comes from agents. And it is the same 10 to 20% that teach and guide the rest of the agent force on how to be more effective in the field and, and also with their clients. Without superstar producers, there is a good chance that many carriers would deem broker distribution as a waste of time, money, and resources due to the poor results they receive and how high-maintenance brokers can be. In decades past, it was quite common that those who were performing at superstar status levels of production kept their secrets and tips to themselves. The insurance industry titans moved in silence and discretion for fear of giving away too many of their secrets to potential competitors and possibly losing their golden throne atop the hill. Thankfully, nowadays, these outdated philosophies have been mostly done away with and sharing transparency and collaboration is in full effect in many insurance agent circles. Not to say that agents and agencies today will open their doors and tell you every little thing that they are doing, but the sharing and the one-for-all mentality is definitely more present today than it ever was 20 years ago, hell, even 10 years ago. Every industry has top performers who achieve things that their peers marvel at. And I'm willing to bet that many of the strategies shared here will be the same across every industry, not just insurance. What makes someone a top performer is not usually smarts, a fancy education, or handouts from their upline. Not that intelligent doesn't exist with many of these top performers, but what allows them to get to where they are has much more to do with their commitment to greatness, willingness to do what others won't, and overall tenacity in every area of their business. I have had many conversations with top performers over the years, and one word they have always used to describe their success and how they achieve it is grit. Let's define the word, shall we? Courage and resolve strength of character. I don't consider myself extremely intelligent. If you read my first book, How to Be a Six-Figure Medicare Agent, then you know that I was not anything special coming up. Early on in my life, you would not have picked me to become who I did. Plenty are smarter than me. So what? You know how many people are out there who can't pay their bills? They might be smarter than me. It's more than you and I could even fathom, though. You don't need a 4.0 GPA graduate magna cum laude, or have an expensive piece of paper called a college education to be a superstar. Anybody who thinks that you do is either confused or has never seen what a true superstar producer looks like in this business, let alone insurance sales in general. Now that we have defined what a superstar actually looks like, let's talk about why you should strive to be one no matter who you are. Chapter 2 why you must become a superstar. I would imagine a majority of individuals who read this book will be thinking one of two things right about now. Number one, I want to be a superstar. Let's roll. Number two, I don't need to be a superstar. I just want to be happy and pay my bills. Unfortunately for all of you who, are the, who thought the former, we first have to address the latter. As a matter of fact, I thought this point was so important that I dedicated an entire chapter to explaining the horribly flawed mentality of number two. What I'm about to say is going to sound a bit in your face, so just hear me out. If you thought number two, up until this point, you are being selfish and only thinking about you and nobody else. Let me explain. Think for a moment about what that line of thinking is really saying. I don't want to work too hard. I don't need that level of success. I only want to be happy, as if happiness has anything to do with success or one has one, anything to do with the other. More on that later. What about your family? 
What about your loved ones? What about your community? What about charities that you're passionate about and you feel the need to support? What about your church? What about contributing to the society in a way that impacts people's lives in a multitude of different ways, whether you are helping them with their coverage or teaching someone else how to feed their family? This line of thinking is only considering me, me, me. It's not thinking about everybody else around you that could be helped immensely by you becoming a superstar. In society, we are taught by many sources that successful people are bad and greedy. Maybe some are, but for the most part, this could be furthest from the truth and from reality. I will give you some examples. Number one, Bill Gates. At the time of writing this book, Bill is estimated to be worth $124 billion with a B. It is estimated that Bill has given over $45 billion to charity. Number two, Warren Buffett. At the time of writing this book, Warren is estimated to be worth $94 billion. It is estimated that he has given $48 billion to charity. With a pledge before his life is over, by the way, to donate 99% of his wealth to charity. George Kaiser. George is estimated to be worth over $5 billion at the time of writing this book. He has reportedly given away over a billion dollars to various charitable organizations. Ted Turner. Ted is estimated to be worth over $2 billion and at the time of writing this book has reportedly donated over $1 billion to charity. I could go on, but I think you get the point. Some of the most generous people I have ever met in my personal life have been the most successful. How about that? Not only are superstars and successful people able to donate money to good causes, but they can impact people's lives in so many positive ways. Number one, they're good for the economy. Number two, they create jobs down the road which helps more people take care of their families. Number three, they are great for their clients and customers who desperately need their help. People often forget that we aren't ripping off our clients. We're providing them with a service that they not only are in need of, but they're very grateful to have. As an agent, your income is in direct correlation with how many people you help. Never forget that. More importantly than all of this, superstars are able to provide for their families in a way that they will never have to struggle or worry about finances again. People always think in the capacity of just enough. Just enough to get by. Just enough to pay our bills. Just enough for our nest egg. The holes in this logic involve things like the unexpected emergencies and or disasters you and your loved ones might encounter. Nobody likes to think about these obstacles, but these types of roadblocks always arise. Take into consideration the cost of living increase year in and year out. I was on the record on my first podcast stating that once the government started to print money in 2020 to combat COVID and send out stimulus checks and bail out massive corporations who were struggling, that we would see a rise in inflation unlike any we have ever seen before. Sure enough, we did, but nobody was talking about that at the time. I have news for you also. These issues with the economy are not going to stop. Sure, they may slow down, but your money is always going to be going down in value, always. The definition of inflation is a general increase in prices and fall in the purchasing value of money. Inflation is easy to understand once you break it down. The more something exists, the less valuable it is to consumers. Let's use sports cars as an example. A vintage sports car that only had 50 ever produced is going to command far greater value than a similar model that had 10 million copies produced or 10 million models produced. Same with the dollar. The government is always going to be printing more money. This is inevitable. If you are curious as to why, Robert Kiyosaki has some great books breaking down why the government took us off the gold standard and what that means for our money. It is estimated that 70 to 80 percent of all the U.S. dollars that are currently in circulation were printed in 2020 and 2021 alone. To think that massive inflation would not be right around the corner is craziness. I'm not surprised at all at the cost surges that we've been seeing all over America. What do you think you can live off today will likely no longer be the case in years to come. In a world where saving money may as well be the same as losing it, whatever you calculate as enough to take care of your family, if you live in the I just want enough camp, likely will not be enough in the future. People like only to think about the here and the now. 
But no matter who you are, no matter how good of a person you are, and no matter where you come from, you will experience financial setbacks over the course of your career. Not only is sitting back and limiting what you're able to create for yourself and your family risky, I will go as far as to say that it is reckless and irresponsible. You should aim high and strive to slay it, not only for yourself, but for everybody around you. This may not be the message that you want to hear, but it certainly is the one that you need to hear. Every time I see an insurance agent online complaining about the cost of this and the cost of that, I know that they are not taking the necessary steps to propel themselves into superstar status. Otherwise, their minds wouldn't be on other things, and they wouldn't be worried about things they have no control over. When you are doing just enough, what you are really saying to yourself is, I don't want to make the necessary sacrifices to display the level of grit that is required to obtain this ultimate level of success. People always come back and say they want to spend time with their kids. I do too, and guess what? I do. I spend more time with my daughter than most parents do. You know what I don't have time for that most others find time for? Playing video games, watching hours of TV, reading every post on social media, going out at night and getting drunk. Most of the time, the people who are saying that they can't spend more time working because they want to spend more time with their kids or on their family are spending more time doing worthless activities I mentioned above more than they're actually even spending time with their kids. I give up these activities because they are not a priority to me. I used to live 30 minutes away from my office, so I was driving an hour round trip to get to where I was trying to go to get to work every day um, here and back. That eats into daddy-daughter time. What did I do? I bought a house three minutes from my office and got rid of the drive time. There is enough time in your life to chase big goals without being a deadbeat parent. People just like to use things like that as a convenience to give themselves an out as to why they can't go after it. In addition to all of this, we, we haven't even gotten to the part that benefits you. Not only is striving to be great, fantastic for everybody around you, but it is also good for you, even if you don't think so. It is not a bad thing to want to live a great life, not just financially, but from the standpoint that you are a go-getter and you are a goal-oriented person who sees your goals through. For most of us, there are few things in life that feel better than a sense of accomplishment. A feeling of success builds your confidence, makes you feel like you have a purpose that is worthwhile, and lets you make a great living while doing it. What can be better than that? Truthfully, our society has far more average thinking people than people who think with a mindset of abundance. That is why we have so many people in our everyday lives encouraging us not to chase big goals and big aspirations. How many times have you heard somebody close to you tell you, you know, there's more to life than this, or you need to stop and smell the roses. While likely with good intentions, I don't want to hear these things from people. It's advice given when people aren't chasing their goals and targets like they should be, and they need to justify it to themselves why they aren't focused and have the same drive and level of concentration as you do. Your drive, focus, and determination makes them feel uneasy about their lack of it all, and it has more to do with the con conversation they are having internally than it does about you. Chapter 3. Get your priorities in check. We have discussed the why of becoming a superstar, but now we need to start discussing the how. I don't believe this can be accomplished without first breaking down and understanding your priorities and what that means in your journey, as well as the impact it has on you as a whole. This chapter might also be a little bit in your face, but hopefully you are used to that by now. I'm going to make a statement that I want you to, to take a deep look at yourself internally and answer with complete honesty. If you have not had the level of success that you would like, it is because you're prioritizing the wrong things in your life. Read that back to yourself a second time, maybe a third time. Ask yourself, what matters most to me in my life? What truly comes first? Some of you might say, my spouse, my children, my religion, etc. All were the answers. However, I'm going to challenge that line of thinking a bit. If you answered one of the above, I think for a moment you should consider this. Your success should be, at the very least, equal to any other priority in your life, if not number one. Why? You being successful has such a large impact on those around you. It doesn't just benefit you. 
As I stated in the previous chapter, becoming a superstar and being massively successful helps you take care of your loved ones that are close to you. It helps you make donations to your church and community. The lack of importance placed on being successful is actually far more selfish than the pursuit of attaining success. Far too often, I will talk to someone who says, I love my wife. I just want to spend time with her and make her happy. My immediate thoughts are, it's time to step up and take care of your wife, dude. There is a misconception that you cannot have both happiness and success at the same time. Of course you can. Are all successful people miserable? I don't believe that one bit. I think it's just something that unsuccessful people tell themselves to justify their lack of commitment to becoming successful. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure that there are individuals out there that didn't get the happiness part of their lives figured out, and as a result, they are not happy people. All I am saying is they are completely separate categories from each other. Being happy and being successful take both work and commitment. I fail to buy into the notion that I have to give up one or the other. Do I have to make sacrifices to become successful? You bet I do. It doesn't mean I have to sacrifice my happiness. Part of being happy is finding fulfillment in the pursuit of success. The progress and the process and the journey of becoming a superstar is huge. If you convince yourself it's no fun or it's miserable work, you will become miserable as a result. So, several studies show that most people will spend about a third of their lives at work. If you want to be a superstar, it might need to be a bit more than that. You must find fulfillment in the climb to prosperity. It's much easier to get somewhere if you make the most of it. Stop telling yourself everything is hard and difficult. The more you tell your mind that, the more you're going to believe it, and more importantly, feel it. It will be like an anchor around your neck dragging you down with it. Do you hate making sales calls? Tell yourself you love them. Look yourself in the mirror and say, I enjoy and love making sales calls, and believe it. Repeat it until you believe it. Grant Cardone often says, there is a power in getting great at something you hate. Embrace it and watch what happens to your production. Leaderboards, baby. It's time we talk about who you're spending your time with and what you spend your time doing. You want to know what superstars don't spend their time doing? Number one, going out on the town every night going to bars and clubs, if you are doing nothing but spending your time with people who live for the escape of intoxication, you are going to turn out just like them. These types of individuals start their days waiting for them to end and likely spend a majority of their time and money wasting it to douse their body with alcohol and potentially things even more extreme. Now let me clarify, I am not against alcohol. I like to have a drink as much as the next guy, but if I am constantly feeling hungover, tired, and coming off a night on the town, I assure you I am not going to be as alert and focused to have my best the next day. I am in it to win it, and if I encounter somebody in the marketplace who was out partying the night before, I'm going to take their lunch money every single time because I am rested, focused, and present. Number two, they have a zero tolerance policy for negative small-minded thinking. This type of mentality is poison. Have you ever heard of the law of association? You will be the average of the five people you spend the most time with. This can work in your favor and it can work to your detriment. If you want to be a superstar, make sure that you are including as many superstars in that five as possible. You should be surrounding yourself with people who are pushing you to do more and are helping you to challenge you to believe what is possible. I have no interest in chicken little and sky is falling mentality. Worrying about things can cause you to doubt your decision making and stop you from making bold, aggressive steps towards what you want in life. Number three, they are never bored. If you're out moving and grooving and shaking and baking, you are never bored. Bored means you aren't spending your time wisely. I am never bored. I am so busy each and every day, I hardly ever get everything done that I have to do that day. I start early and I work late. I do this because I am driven. I have a purpose. I go crazy if I am sitting around doing nothing. I'm sure a shrink would probably have a field day with somebody like me. They would slap me with titles like workaholic or some other label to try to paint a picture that there is something wrong with my commitment to my and my family's abundance. Let's talk about that last part for a second. People are not going to understand your commitment to becoming a true superstar in our industry. They will criticize you. They will try to put you down. They will make comments like, you've changed. Pay none of that any mind. 
in this world to be one of the top in your field in any industry, it takes an extreme level of commitment and work ethic to make that happen. Most people just are not going to understand that. They will make statements like smell the roses or YOLO, meaning you only live once, while I appreciate their thoughts as I know that they are only trying to give me advice and they mean well. I am on a different mission than they are. As I said earlier, you don't have to sacrifice your happiness to achieve the level of accomplishment I'm talking about in this book. I already showed you my level of commitment to making time for my family as well as my obligations for growing my company by selling my house to reduce my commute, my commute time. I would encourage you to make a list of what you spend time doing every single day and how can you remove things from your plate. You might be surprised at how many things that you spend time on on a day-to-day basis that take away from both working and your family time. I'm not going to lie to you, I spend 95% of my time on a day-to-day basis either working or spending time with my family or sleeping. I rarely go out and do something fun for myself. I do from time to time, but I am committed to the idea that in 10 years, I may be able to retire if I so chose to. That is control over your own destiny. Not to say I ever actually will retire, but you get the point. I have the option to. My commitment will pay off. I know many people that struggle with the battle against themselves. They are their own worst enemy. It's not an easy battle to win sometimes when family members, close friends, and acquaintances try to discourage the path less traveled, the path of becoming a true superstar. It takes true mental strength and discipline to knock those outside noises out and double down on what you are going for. That is why it is so important to put people in your life that aren't dragging you down in a different category and off to the side. You absolutely have to win the mental battle and the mental game if you want to be massively successful. It is as important of an area as anything else in this book. Most people want to do just enough to get by. Pay their bills, save a little, retire at age 65, hello, true up, wink, wink, Medicare agents, and just live their life. I don't put anybody down for wanting this out of life, but it's not what I want out of life. If I'm going to do something, I want to do it at the best of my abilities and do it big and reach my full potential as a human being. I don't want to just scratch the surface. It is imperative that you understand that showing up day in and day out is not just a priority, it is your responsibility. Take control of your schedule, go to bed at a decent hour, get up early and go to the gym and work out, and have a good morning routine. This stuff is so difficult for so many, and I am not saying I am perfect by any means, but I do my best and I recognize the importance of it. Being a master of your day and the master of your own mind to discipline yourself to get the most out of the day as possible is widely looked at as a very, very necessary um, aspect of life by top athletes, business people, performers, and yes, insurance agents over the top of their competition. Do what others are willing to do and you will get what others aren't going to get. In short, get your shit together. Chapter 4. Let go of the hand. This chapter might be confusing to some, so I will start off by explaining what I mean up front here. You must let go of the hand of your teacher, mentor, upline, etc., and start taking charge of things. Before you fly off the handle on me, let me explain what this means. It is so important, so important, to have a great teacher and a great mentor. It could be the difference between success and failure for many. You want to soak in their knowledge Learn from their past mistakes to save you from making them yourself and let them show the path to success for you. Now, that being said, superstars don't need their hand held. They just don't. Maybe at the beginning of their journey, but not for long. Superstars take charge. They don't place their success at the feet of somebody else. They know that how far they will go in business, in relationships, and in life starts and ends with them. They accept that is their responsibility to be successful and not their uplines or their mentors. As stated, can a good mentor or upline help you and make your path easier? Yes, no doubt about it. But what makes or breaks you is you, period. In my office, I try to discourage neediness. I try to encourage problem solving and critical thinking. As an organization, we can only get so far and only get so much done if everybody is doing everything they can to bring results to the table. One of my mentors and close friends in the industry routinely says, don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution. I've grasped onto this and it has helped my productivity 
and the productivity of my team quite a bit. I am also very fortunate to have great people on my team also, so that certainly helps. But I haven't always hired the right people. I look for people who don't need to be micromanaged, babysat, and assisted with every little issue. Some are able to do this right away, and others are able to grow into it over time as they gain more experience. Others just never figure out how to be a problem solver. Every superstar agent I have ever come in contact with has a few things in common. Number one, they aren't helpless. I can't tell you how many agents I have known who have been trained on something multiple times and just freeze up at the simplest things. I am not trying to disparage anybody, but at the same time, it is critical that agents are strong and confident. It is okay to ask questions, but asking nonstop questions about every little thing shows that an agent might not be a problem solver. I give a pass to brand new agents, and again, questions are good, but everybody I know who has been a top performer has the ability to figure certain things out, research problems, and think critically to bring a solution, not just a problem. Number two, they get to the point in their own abilities where they would be a successful no matter who their upline was. I'm not, say, I'm not saying that a great situation would be sought after and it would make them more successful as a result, and you want great partnerships and relationships. However, partnership doesn't mean they make you a success. You do that. They just help you along the way, which is important. You make the calls. You write the apps. It's on you. My agency, for example, would be successful practically anywhere. Does that mean we can be more successful with the right partnerships? Yes, you bet. But we won't crash and burn anywhere because we will continue to thrive because of us. This is because we are growing and we are succeeding because of the day-to-day -day basis activities that we do day in and day out. Nobody is dragging us to the finish line. Don't be dead weight. Get up and run a little. The goal for any agent that wants to be a superstar should be to be self-sufficient. You could have the best upline slash mentor in the world, but if you still are going to be able to write a lot of business at a high volume, you're going to have to be able to handle a majority of situations yourself. How do you do this? These would be my keys to making this a reality. Number one, become an absolute force in your line of insurance. Learn the products you offer down to the finest detail. Truly become an expert. At the start of my career, I would spend my days prospecting and getting in front of potential customers and my nights studying and learning the plans. I wanted to be able to answer a benefit question off the top of my head, and I could do that rather quickly after putting in the extra work. When agents need to ask simple questions long, long term, it's because they aren't doing this. They are relying on their upline to be their anchor. That is all right, but I don't know anybody who is wildly successful that doesn't truly become knowledgeable and an expert at what they offer. Do you think it builds confidence in potential customer when you are sitting with them and you need to call somebody else to get an answer? No, it doesn't. Study and learn. Number two, Zig Ziglar once said, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. Stamp that on your forehead. Take charge of situations. Make it your moral obligation to resolve issues and solve problems for people. If you don't know the answer to something or how you resolve something, you have a lot of tools at your disposal. You have your upline, yes, but you also have this little thing called Google, Facebook groups, carrier agent line supports. You can find the answer. Don't just curl up in a ball and act helpless because you're not. Number three, all of this comes with a specific work ethic, so develop that. Be aware of it. We will talk about this in a later chapter. Again, this is not to discourage anybody who finds comfort in asking a lot of questions, but don't become so reliant on your upline or another person that you ask questions to that you aren't capable of figuring anything out on yourself. Take charge. Chapter 5. Start Thinking Bigger If I had known and truly understood the principles I'm going to map out for you in this chapter when I first got into this industry, I can only imagine where I would be right now. I have been successful. Very successful at that, but my limiting beliefs early on certainly held me back from reaching my full potential. I don't want to see that happen to you. When I first got into the insurance industry, I remember asking my first mentor, what is the most you think I can make in this business? Their response was, oh, I don't know, maybe 500000 a year. Now to most, that might sound great and like a tremendous amount. But to my ears at that young of an age, to hear that he had thought that was my ceiling and I couldn't climb any higher, it discouraged me and caused me to lose interest in insurance a bit. 
It's not that I ever got out of the business or I ever quit building, but I started doing other things on the side. I drove for Uber for a little bit to make some extra money. I joined a couple of multi-level marketing companies or MLMs. When I look back at those years, it makes me absolutely sick to my stomach because there is one principle I didn't understand at that time. All the time I spent doing those other things, those side gigs, quote unquote, or side hustles, took away from my primary source of income. Not only did it take away from it, it also stunted my growth because my focus and attention was not all where it needed to be, and that was my insurance business. I wish that somebody had taken me aside and shook, shaken me and told me that I was making a really stupid mistake. I obviously learned that over time and later on, but I wished I knew that from day one. Well, I'm going to shake you and be in your face in this chapter again. I'm going to do that for you, and I'm going to do for you what wasn't done for me early on in my career. I was discouraged by the advice I was given on my earning potential because at that point in time, I was starting to study people who were massively successful, and I didn't want to put my blood, sweat, and tears into something that had a cap. I still was selling and doing well, but I wasn't climbing like I should have been. I almost felt like, what was the point? Want to know what I found out? The advice that I was given was horrible advice and just flat out wrong. The answer is there is no cap to what you can make and what you can build in this business. Accepting the wrong information set me back. I can't tell you enough how damaging and harmful it can be to accept bad information. The information was given with the best of intentions, but it was mistaken and false. Here is the truth. Whatever you want to do in this business, it will be for you. Whatever you want this business to be, it will be for you, good or bad. But if you want to build an empire, this business is a great vehicle for making that a reality. If you want to be a megastar producer, you can do that if you follow the principles in this book. The biggest things that get away from agents is their limiting beliefs. The mentality of thinking too small and not thinking big enough. I always use the analogy of a map and going on a trip. With a map, it can make it much easier to drive to Canada. You know where you are trying to get to. Without a map, just randomly driving around and hoping you might get there, you might end up in Mexico instead, the farthest possible place away you can drive to. The ability to think big and have big intentions with what you want to do is a powerful tool and is a key differentiation between average producers and superstars. Top producing agents set big goals while normal agents set small goals for fear, for fear of not hitting big goals that they actually want to set. You ever hear the phrase, shoot for the stars, even if you miss, you'll land on the moon? Well, if you shoot for just a little bit off the ground, even the moon will never be a possibility. There is a method to the madness when it comes to setting and achieving big targets. Here's my step-by-step. Step. Number one, set the target big. If you want to get 100 new clients in the year, try pushing that to 500 or 1,000. It may scare you, but if your goals don't scare you, they aren't big enough. Number two, setting big goals and targets are great, but so many people stop there. They, they set no plan to actually get there. This isn't the secret where you imagine things and they show up. We live in the real world where you actually have to go out and get things. One thing that I love about setting big goals is once you set them, typically your mind already starts working on what would need to be done for them to actually become a reality. What would it take for you to accomplish your big goal? What would you need? If it's a production goal, figure out what it, you would actually have to do to make it happen. If you just set a big goal and keep doing the same level of activity and process you were doing previously to hit your little goals, guess what you will be? in the same place you were before, hitting those same little results you had prior. Number three, do the math. Figure out how many people you would need to talk to. Calculate your closing ratios. I will give you an example clear as day. In the Medicare world, for example, if you buy leads from a vendor, I always say the average agent should close about 20% of their leads. So if an agent wants to get 100 new clients at a 20% closing ratio, they will need 500 leads. See how easy that is? I'm not saying that buying leads from a vendor is the only way to get a client and is even the best way to get a client, but it's a very simple example that everybody can understand. I have a whole chapter about leads, so we will, wait, we will save the talk on leads until we get there. Figure out your numbers and figure out what will actually be required to hit your target goal. What will the cost financially be and what will it cost in effort slash time? The mind is a powerful thing. 
For better or for worse, whatever you convince yourself that you can do or can't do, that's exactly where you will be. For many agents, it is just about realizing what is possible. Think about things like this. There are people in our space that have built and sold seven, eight, and even nine-figure businesses. For the most part, when you speak to these individuals, they weren't over-the-top smart or had some incredible opportunity that was gifted upon them that was unique to them. Not that they weren't smart. They were, but a lot of their smarts came from understanding what is possible. Ask yourself, why not me? If they did it, why can't I? Let me make one thing clear. You don't have to build or scale a massive business to be a superstar. You can crank out business in the masses just you. This book is how to produce in mass amounts, so that is what we're going to talk about. Confidence is going to be key in thinking big. One thing I love so much about sports is how many crossovers there are with business. Athletes always have supreme confidence in themselves. How often have you seen a player in any particular sport and you thought to yourself, man, they just have a big ego. They're an egomaniac. We all see players make statements that they feel like they are the best in the sport when clearly they are not. But you know what? I'm not mad when I see a player make a statement like that. It's that supreme confidence that got themselves in the place they are in the first place. Such is true in business. It takes a certain mentality and self-confidence in yourself to be a superstar. You need to carry yourself like you're the baddest man or woman on the planet that does what you do. People like to do business with people who are confident and sure of themselves. Even if you don't feel it in the moment, fake it until you make it. Fake the confidence and eventually it will be real confidence once you have enough progress. Confidence can also be seen in the goals you are setting and how big you are thinking. It takes a certain level of self-belief to believe that you can set huge goals and run right through them. I can already hear the person reading this book and screaming in their living room, Christian, we need to be humble. Yes, humility is important, but being humble doesn't mean you have to be a timid little mouse and have no confidence in yourself. Humility to me is the ability to take advice from someone who is more successful than you and apply it. Confidence is the ability to execute on that advice. Chapter 6. Become resourceful. Let's define resourceful. The ability to find quick and clever ways to overcome difficulties. I just love that description. When you have issues in life, what do you value about a resolution? A speedy solution or resolution. What does it take to resolve an issue in life? It takes out-of-the-box thinking or clever thinking. I talk about being resourceful in my office a lot. It will reward you in every area in life, especially in the insurance business. In our line of work, we often are dealing with very complex situations, claims, policy benefits, rules and regulations, compliance, etc. I often will talk with agents who feel like they need to know every little detail of everything that goes on in their line of work. The answer I give them typically stresses them out. Well, once you get it all down, tell me some of it because I haven't learned everything I need to know after all my years of experience. I am not just being sarcastic when I say that either. Well, maybe a little, but I am being more real. I run into situations from time to time that I still haven't encountered before with agents and clients. Let's get something out of the way. Insurance is complex and it isn't simple. As such, it is not realistic to expect that it's going to be simple to navigate even for us as insurance professionals. The reason why the ability to be resourceful is so valuable is not only our line of work, but in life in general, is because to be successful in life, you must have the ability to figure certain things out. Become a critical thinker and think about solutions instead of problems. Yes, there is a barrier in front of you. If your life depended on getting around it, what would you do? How would you solve that problem? I guarantee you wouldn't throw your hands up in the air and say, I don't know what to do, I give up. No, you would start to think outside the box and let your mind work on a true solution. As we discussed in the previous chapter, some people struggle not having their hand held. You aren't a child. It's time to stop acting like one. Stand up on your own two feet and embrace being a problem solver. Problem solvers go much farther in life than hand holders. It is okay to ask questions when you are truly stuck. The problem with that is most people don't even try to solve the problem before they ask the question. 
the attempt to find a solution is not even on their mind. If you want to be a superstar, you better start being a critical thinker as well. Practice being quick on your feet. So often insurance agents are babied and coddled by their uplines because they're afraid to upset them by telling them the truth. Well, I'm not. I'm telling you this because you need to hear it in order to be successful. Telling you what you want to hear is never a good substitute for telling you what you need to hear. If you had good parents growing up, they weren't your friends. They did not buddy around with you. They made sure your butt was in gear and they were leaning, leading you down the path that you needed to go down. Sometimes, often, that's the same kind of guidance you need as an agent. Let's address something in line with this topic. To be a superstar, it is not easy and it doesn't just happen. It happens for people who make it happen. Being a top performer involves being able to take matters into your own hands with what you can control. Things you can't control include chargebacks, clients no showing you, carriers changing things under your feet, government regulation for something like Medicare, some, someone on your team quitting unexpectedly. All those things are hard and you can't always control them. What you can control is how you respond to those types of situations. These kinds of setbacks happen to everybody in some form or fashion, but how you deal with them is what separates you from the pack. Here are things you can control. Getting more clients to soften the chargebacks. Scheduling more appointments so no-shows don't hurt as much. Unique processes to deal with more regulation. Getting right back up on the horse and trying to hire someone to replace the person that left. Nobody ever received a huge check that read for being a victim in the subject line. Bad things and challenges happen in our lives. It's okay to get knocked down sometimes, but you can't stay down. Winners take a punch to the face and keep walking forward. Your clients will look at you as a problem solver and notice your resourcefulness the more they encounter it. It will become that you are known for all around town being the go-to guy. Jessica is my go-to. She gets things done. That is what you want clients and customers to be saying about you when your name comes up. You become so valuable to your clients by being able to solve problems that they could never solve themselves. Being a true resource to them makes you irreplaceable. Superstars understand that their clients need them. You must bring value into their lives. Being a true master of solutions allows this to happen at the highest possible level. Here is the focus that you will need to have in solving problems and being resourceful in your business. Number one, speed. Try to get answers quickly. Customers will see this and be amazed with your intent to get things done quickly for them. Number two, always over deliver what they are expecting in your service. This is a big one. If you exceed their expectations, they will always remember you for that. Number three, do things for your clients that your competition typically won't do. Service may seem dead in other industries, but when people get it, it stands out even more. I implore you at this very moment to take responsibility for these following items. Your success, your production, your future, your family's well-being, your fulfillment professionally and personally. Others can help you, but how successful you're going to be is up to you. Own it, and let's move forward with pride. Chapter 7 it is never the leads. I often hear agents complain about leads. They are the natural punching bag when things aren't going well. It's the leads! They are no good! Nobody on earth could convert these leads. These are things that agents commonly mutter to themselves after being hung up on for the fifth time in a row. Let's be clear. Nobody bats a hundred in any kind of sales. Nobody. However, I promise you that if some agents, including myself, can create clients from just cold calling a data list, then the leads you are complaining about can be sold, maybe just not with the approach you are using. For those of you who don't know, I started my insurance career doing nothing but cold calling for Medicare supplements. These are people who have never asked to hear from me, and I was dialing from a data list. If you think your leads are no good, spend six months cold calling. I was called every name in the book, hung up on, threatened, and more. Cold calling is brutal, but I did it for years until I started to actually work leads. I got so good at cold calling and conducting myself on the phone that I made six figures on the back of cold calling without ever needing to buy a lead. Was it fun? No. 
Was it the most efficient way to build my business? Hell no. But what it did do for me is I learned how to conduct myself on the phone and have the thickest skin imaginable. For me, even the worst lead seems like gold compared to cold calling. I've made a lot of sales from direct mail leads, age leads, shared leads, internet leads, Facebook leads, Google SEO, opt-in leads, telemarketing leads, live transfer leads, and on and on. There is no lead that I cannot make a sale with if I have a large enough sample size. Why is that? It's because I have crafted my sales ability over years of phone calls in different types of situations. Let's start out by understanding what a lead is. I'm going to give you The Christian Brindle definition of a lead. A person who has expressed vague interest at best in a product or service through some form of response. This could be a mailer, online or social media form, or maybe even an inbound call or phone transfer. Leads come in many different shapes and forms, but at the end of the day, a lead is a lead. The sooner you realize that, the sooner you will get out of your own way with your complaints. It's not the lead. It's your approach in calling the lead. In working the lead, it's what you're saying. It's how you're saying it. Something that you're doing needs to be changed in order for you to have positive results in a vacuum. Too many agents are expecting to just take orders when they buy a batch of leads. You have to do more than just show up. If you are calling a lead and sounding like you can't wait to get home or are thinking about what you're going to be having for dinner that night rather than talking to them, you aren't going to get far. Here are my keys to being effective when it comes to calling leads. Number one, confidence. If you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to either. You must have enthusiasm on the phone. Nobody is going to respond to a timid little mouse. Let them know you are there. If you lack confidence, people are going to push you around and control the phone call. You must always control the phone call no matter what. Number two, be present. Don't be dozing off. Stop thinking about that movie you saw last night. Stop daydreaming about that girl or guy you have a crush on. The only person you should be thinking about and locked into is the person on the other end of the phone. People can tell when you aren't listening to them, and it comes out later, if you get that far, when they are expecting you to reply. Be present, embrace the call, and let your prospect know that you're on a mission to help them. Number three, Get your tones right. You must get your tonalities right. A tone in a sales call is when you emphasize certain words and phrases. I always start my calls off with a higher, more excited tone to start off right. Hi, is this John? They feel my excitement. They know I'm enthusiastic to talk to them. Other parts of the call, I'm going to lower my tone back down to cause more of a serious energy to drive home a certain point. I'm getting back to you on the reply card that you sent back into my office, John. Tones matter a lot. Watch Jordan Belfort's training videos on this and you can get a great feel for how you should be conducting yourself and using your tonalities on a sales call. Number four, keywords. It's not about what you say, it's how you say it. You should always choose your words wisely when selling a policy. There are words you don't want to say to a potential client. Here are some examples. Sales or sell. You never want to tell your clients you sell for this insurance company or we sell this product. People have been programmed their entire life to not be sold by people. Once they hear the word, their shields instantly go up and they're on guard against everything you say. Instead of saying we sell something, say we offer something. We offer this product. We offer this insurance company's product. See how much better that sounds? I will have a full list for you at the end of this chapter. Number five, ask for what you want on a sales call. Always ask. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. Whatever your objective is, whether it's a commitment to meet with you or an appointment or whether you just want to talk to them in a situation and make, you maybe even make them buy something over the course of that sales call, you must always ask. If you're selling over the phone, I believe the rule of thumb should be ask three times for the close and get the rejection three times before you give up on somebody. Ask, ask, ask. Number six, get right to the point. Stop asking people how they are. Get to the point when you're making calls. One thing you must understand when it comes to talking to leads is they don't want to talk to you. You have interrupted their day and their Patience and attention span are only so long. Don't waste it with idle chat. chat. 
go right in why you why you called in the first place and begin your fact finding. They actually prefer that because your call won't take forever and you have a much better chance of getting somewhere positive on your call. Number seven, control the call. I felt like this deserved its own section. Don't let them push you around. Control the call. Also, don't let them tell you things that you know aren't true. You know more than they do about what you're offering by a lot. Remember that always. You always want to remain in agreement with the prospect. Arguing is not good, but don't let them throw you off by telling you something about your product or service that you know for a fact isn't true. Don't let people just bulldoze you. Fortune favors the assertive. It's difficult for us as humans to admit that we have a problem with anything. In marriage, in our relationships, in our businesses, it is hard for anybody to admit that they are the reason they aren't converting leads. It's far easier to blame the leads and say they suck. Are some leads better quality and higher intent than others? Yeah, certainly. But you should never lose money on a batch of leads if you have enough volume on them. I don't care where they came from. I want to address something else that I hear a lot. I don't want to work leads. I want people to call me. While I am a big believer in the, in the long-term tactic, it's just that, long-term focus, and it takes a long time to develop inbound sales calls and nothing but them, and typically it requires a lot of money to do it right. When you are first starting out, and if you were making under $500,000 in revenue, you, then you should definitely be buying leads in some form or fashion. Leads are a necessity for your business to grow. There are plenty of things that are long-term focuses that bring in business long-term, but buying leads is working leads in the short-term, fast-acting solution to, a, to production and revenue. Leads are like gasoline that you pour on the fire that is your business. Stop complaining about your leads. Embrace them. Try to improve your process and your sales skills. Volume is very important in the leads game as well, but... We will talk about that in a future chapter. If your script or approach isn't working, throw it away and start from scratch. If one person can't sell a lead and another person can, then it's not the leads. It's the one person that's saying something and handling it in a certain way that the other person is not. One thing you can do to help you fix this situation is to record a few of your sales calls and appointments, then go through them later on and listen and find areas that you can improve on. It's easy to feel like we are saying something right in the moment, or we explain something well, but upon hearing it on replay, you will catch things you didn't think about that you could potentially improve on. If you want to be a superstar, you must become a student of the game of sales. Great athletes become students of their games. They are always working at getting better at their craft, even if they are already pretty damn good. That's the way you should be as a salesperson. Your craft is making a sales call, running appointments, and writing apps. It's time to become world class at it. Here are, here are those additional keywords that I mentioned earlier. Number one, contract. Instead of contract, say paperwork. We're just going to have to do some paperwork, Martha, to put this in place. People have been told that by their parents, the media, and pretty much everybody else in their lives to never sign a contract. Contract is a bad word. Number two, sign here. Instead of sign here, say, may I get your autograph here? This almost comes across like you are flattering them. Everybody dreams of being famous and people asking for their autograph. Number three, customer. Instead of calling the people you serve customers, call them clients. It just sounds a little bit more like a relationship. Number four, sorry to bother you. I have heard lots of agents say things like, sorry to bother you, but, and go right into their pitch. Saying this just makes them remember that you are indeed bothering them. Number five, is this a good time? This gives them an option to say no and to easily get you off the phone. Just don't say it. Number six, this is so-and-so with so-and-so company. This is bad because you sound like a solicitor. People will always hang up on you first and fast. This is how I teach my agents to make calls. Hello, is this John? John, this is Christian. I'm getting back to you on a card you sent back into my office in the last couple of weeks. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions to determine if I can be of any service? And right into the fact find. That opening script has made me millions of dollars in commissions over the years. By just saying your name, you stick with getting to the point, and you disarm them momentarily, which buys you a little bit of extra time because their mind is racing thinking if they know you. Christian, do I know a Christian? It gives you time to get from point A to point B. Sometimes that's all you need. Chapter 8. 
dominate the volume game. So you have been shown the mentality and the mindset that it takes to be a true superstar, but what about the actual strategy? Nothing drives me crazier than tactics that focus entirely on mindset without any strategic impl implementation involved. It is very much a situation of, okay, I got my mind right, but now what do I do with this new sense of purpose? After a short time of thinking about that question, individuals revert back to how they were prior to the mentality shift. Sound familiar? Well, not today. This chapter may just be the most important one in the whole book, so buckle in. It took me years to learn what I'm about to spell out for you. My first six years in the insurance business, I did nothing but write apps. I did not work with agents, didn't do trainings, and nobody knew me outside of a small group of local connections. Everything in my life revolved around making the sale. I got, I got extremely hung up for some time on a sale, as in one sale. I would chase clients. I would follow up with certain clients literally for years before I would get them as clients. I remember one instance where I was working on a husband and wife who lived over an hour away from me. I drove out to their house to see them 10 times before I got them. Why did it take me 10 times, you ask? They kept flaking on me when I showed up. Nobody was home. Why did I keep going back? It's really simple. They kept rescheduling with me. They wouldn't say no. They never told me no. I was like a pit bull with a massive bite that wouldn't let go once I latched onto something. In retrospect, it was not a bad thing in my early years for me to have this mentality. It helped me gain a lot of clients through my unnatural persistence, many of which nobody could ever take away from me because few would go through what I went through to get their business. I also grew a lot of toughness and thick skin as a result, so I would say it was a good thing. The, the thing is, after a few years, it was hurting me because I was spending so much time on these people. I finally figured out that insurance is the game of large volume. No one sale will ever make or break your business. I was spending so much time chasing individual people as clients than I should have been. The time I was spending pursuing these prospective customers and clients, I could have used the focus on talking to more people and writing more clients who respected my time and profession enough to not put me off repeatedly. Let's take that couple I drove up to their house 10 times for. It took me roughly three hours round trip each time to go see them. They lived relatively far away. I went on Friday every single time. We were talking about two and a half months of this. Yeah, sure, I got, the, I got their business, but we are talking about two clients, not 20, but two. They say the gold is in the follow-up, and this is absolutely true, but at some point, people simply are time wasters. Superstars don't put up with time wasters. They understand that their time is immensely valuable. What superstars do is figure out roughly how much they make per hour in their business any given year. Every hour that they waste that doesn't bring in any revenue is costing them whatever they make an hour. Superstars are playing chess, not checkers. They think about things a different way than everybody else. The person who talks to the most people often wins. Not the person with the highest closing ratio. Not the person that has the best personality. Not the person with the fanciest CRM or website. It's the person who talks to the most people on the most consistent basis. There are many ways to reach people and have them hear your message. We are in an amazing time after all. You can post videos of yourself on YouTube and reach a tremendous amount of people simultaneously. This is smart and should be done, but it takes time for people to discover your message. You can run an online ad and have almost unlimited people see your face and message if you're willing to pay to play. That is more immediate. There are many ways to get in front of people these days. Even still, with all of that, I have known agents who do nothing but door knock who are in the top 1% of earners in our space, who are true superstars. Regardless of how you do it, the person who wins in this game is the person who talks to the most people. Once you figure that out, you will have a level of understanding that most agents will never arrive at. Let's say you're competing against me. You close 30% of your leads, and you're just an absolute wizard on the phone when making dials. Let's say I'm industry average at 20%. Anything above 20% closing ratio on leads is very, very good, by the way. If you meet with 10 people and close 30% of your 30% closing ratio, you got three new clients. I met with 20%, but I, but I met with 20 people, and I got four clients. I win every single time. 
You may be smoother talking than me. You may be, you might even be a better closer than me, but I understood the numbers game far better than you did, so I came out on top. Once you get that, you will understand your mission is to talk to as many people as possible as fast as possible. That should be your battle cry. Stop getting hung up over one or two clients. I get absolutely baffled at the agents that obsess over their commission statements. They can tell you exactly how many days it's been since they made a sale off the top of their head, and they're counting down the days that it's been waiting for their commission check. They spend hours on the phone with insurance carriers tracking their commissions and each and every policy. Nine times out of ten, the commissions are paid right, and they just haven't been paid yet, or maybe it even charged back. They're just being impatient. If these agents would spend half the effort on getting more clients as they do obsessing over their commissions, they would be better off. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe you should check your commission statements every now and then. When we do it in our office, we do it occasionally. Maybe once or twice a year, we will check and see who we're getting paid on and who we aren't, but not to the extent where we're spending more time on that than we're get, when we're spending getting new business. It is a big problem when agents spend too much time worrying about commissions. This costs many agents tens of thousands of dollars in new business because they are far too focused on one or two clients. They aren't thinking about the volume. Even if you don't get paid, the issue isn't that you didn't get paid. It's that you were so reliant on getting paid from one or two clients that you spent hours and hours of income producing activities making sure you got paid. The issue is you don't have enough clients. At some point, one client here and one client there doesn't make that much of a difference in the long run. Volume. Understand it. Embrace it. You'll be far better off for it. Chapter 9. Become the go-to guy or girl. Your clients and customers should look at you as the holy grail when it comes to your line of insurance. If they don't, you have a serious problem on your hands. You either aren't established enough yet, which means you haven't made enough of an impact, see chapter 8 again, or you don't know a great deal about your line of insurance and your clients don't feel overwhelmingly confident in your level of expertise. In my agency, our clients look at me and my staff as the go-to authority for Medicare, which is our primary focus. They rely on us for claims, coverage questions, and even problems with their family members they encounter when their plans aren't even through us at times. They trust us because they know we know our stuff. Why is this important to you and your business? Two reasons, really. Number one, retention. If your clients think that you are the best, they will think twice before they go anywhere else. You should always be breathing confidence into them with your knowledge and your ability to solve their issues. Chances are they won't be able to find the same level of com comfort and expertise information very many places. Most of your competitors are not as well put together as you might think. Number two, referrals. People refer you because they like you, but more than that, they believe the service you provide is stellar. Trust me when I say that people will avoid referring people any place that they don't trust. They feel like if they refer a loved one somewhere and it doesn't go well, that it reflects poorly on them, and in, in cases it actually does. The better you are with your know-how, the more people will send people to you. Most people just want to feel like you are a true expert. When I was a new agent, I didn't feel extremely confident about the policies and carriers that we did carry oftentimes with a lot of our business. Lots of people would spend their time during the day studying up, but that is wasting time, in my opinion, and wasting income-producing activities. You learn by doing, and you need to make sales now, not later. What I did was I took policy booklets home, as I mentioned earlier in another chapter, and when I was done working and I was done trying to make sales and I wasn't out in the field, I would study them at night. I wanted to be a Medicare encyclopedia. Ask anybody that works a lot with me, and most would say that I am. No matter what type of insurance you're selling, whether it be life, PNC, health, or even securities, you should work at knowing a great deal in what you are offering. This will not only help you in areas mentioned above, but it will help you give better sales presentations to new clients, and it will help you close more sales out in the field. A lot of what we do as agents is diagnose somebody's situation and suggest what you feel in your professional opinion will truly be in their best interests. Being able to spit information off the top of your head breathes confidence like you wouldn't believe. 
Word spreads quickly, and once you start to form a reputation as being the go-to individual for your particular line of insurance, it will be like a wildfire that you can't put out. It is so rare in our day and age that people encounter someone who is truly exceptional in their line of work. So when people find that in you, you become the guy or girl to talk to. Think about the time where maybe you had a complex car issue. If you haven't had that challenge, then I envy you. When you find someone who is able to figure it out and does it fast, quick, and in a hurry, every time you talk to someone who is having a car issue, you're usually sending it to this person. It's the snowball effect. Stop trying to take all the shortcuts and taking the easy way out. Do the hard work and study your craft. Work at it. Get better all the time. Attend carrier trainings. Do the work in the evenings. Make sacrifices. I have. And it's worked out fairly well for me. Chapter 10. Revenue is important. It seems as though nobody ever wants to talk about this, but I feel that it is important, so I'm going to address it. So often I hear agents talk about our business and describe it as if we were social workers or working for a charity. Yes, it is true that we help people with a need that they desperately need assistance with, but we don't do it for free. No one insurance agent ever works for free, and if they did, they didn't slash wouldn't stay in business long. I grow tired of hearing the delusion that I hear from many insurance agents when they say things like, it's all about helping my clients, money doesn't matter. If they really meant that, they would be working in a food kitchen. I have often challenged people in our industry who say things like this because the actions don't match the words. They collect their commission check just like everybody else. In our business, the more people you help and assist, the more money you earn as a direct result. The two are connected whether you like it or not. We live in a money-driven world. Everything costs money. You need money to pay your rent or mortgage, buy groceries for your family, have decent clothing for your children, fill your car with gas to get around, fix your car when it breaks down, buy your children or spouse a nice birthday present, take your family on vacation, market your business, pay for your office space, pay for items like CRMs and phone systems, pay the salary of your employees and your team members who contribute to the growth of your organization. I'm only scratching the surface. Everything costs money. I have a challenge for you. Try and go just one day without spending any money on anything. Not a penny. It's not as easy as it may sound. I often think about this. Earning commissions and revenue for helping people with a complex issue is not a crime. There is nothing wrong with it. I am not saying that you shouldn't also enjoy servicing, serving the needs of your clients and making their lives easier. You just need to understand that you can't have one without the other. The reason why this all matters if you want to be a superstar is you must set targets that are monetary. To grow to new heights, you must factor in the financial aspect of what it takes to do that. Whether you are money motivated or not, you need to keep growing your business and taking care of your family. I am fairly money motivated. I'm not so much so that it crosses into my ethics or morals, but I do want to help people in the most efficient way possible and drive profits in my company while doing so. I think every great salesperson and business person understands this. There is more to life than money. I definitely do believe that. But to say that it isn't important to me isn't a good message for people. You need it to continue to grow and move forward. Another element of this topic that people get wrong is what more important What's more important between customer service and retention versus customer acquisition? Gaining new clients is always first and foremost and is a paramount to customer retention. This may go against the grain for some, but it is true that if you want to be a superstar, it does not mean that customer service and retention is not important and they're not valuable aspects of your business, but if push comes to shove, and it comes right down to it, you always want to prioritize new clients first. Have you ever known an agent who built a large book of business, then went into cruise control, metaphorically speaking? I can think of several. All they focused on was customer retention and service. What happens to those people when they do that? Over time, their business and their client base shrinks off and dies. No matter how good your retention efforts are, people will always leave you. You'll always lose clients. Always. Anybody that says they don't is not being truthful. Clients move away, they pass away, and they even leave to go to a competitor. It happens to every agent or agency. 
Over time, those books of businesses shrink and dwindle. Why does this happen? Because if you're not growing, you are shrinking. That is the rule of business. There is no coasting. You must always focus on growth and new clients. Don't fall into the trap of not realizing this. I look at the agent or agency who gets to the place where they have just their head above water and they just sit on it um, as tremendous wasted opportunity. They may not see it, but I certainly do. I see what they could become if they just kept pushing a little farther. I never want that to be me, and if you want to be a superstar, you can't let it be you either. Chapter 11. Commit to hard work. Oh boy, here we go. Another chapter that might feel a little bit in your face. Trust me, it is well-intentioned. This chapter may sum up my 20s for you. I've talked about it a bit, but as I type this, I am currently days away from my 30th birthday. I got into the insurance business at the age of 20, so I basically have spent my entire adult life as an insurance agent. If you read my first book, How to Be a Six-Figure Medicare Agent, then you know I didn't come into the business with a lot of natural talent. I was timid, skinny, nervous, and lacked any sales ability whatsoever. My father, who was over 60 at the time, knew more about computers than I did. I was a mess. What I did have going for me was one thing, and that was my work ethic. My commitment to work has baffled and confused people for years. I would commonly hear things from people that were close to me, such as, Why do you work on weekends? You should be out doing something fun. You really should smell the roses. You know that there is more to life than being successful. I rarely had someone tell me that they admired my commitment. It was always something negative. What did I do? I pushed through. Now I hear admiration for my work ethic and my commitment. The people who tried to get me to stop doing everything that I am doing eventually gave up. They moved on to critique other people. Ever since I was 20, I outworked everybody. I made more calls, came in earlier, stayed later, worked at my own development to become better at sales. I worked to become more knowledgeable about my line of insurance. I worked to become more knowledgeable about computers and the internet and how I could use it to help my business. I recently had a new person join my team who relocated from another state to come work with me. His first day here, my wife and I took him to dinner. On the drive back after a great dinner, he asked me, so Christian, what do you do for fun? My wife smirked and looked away because she knew the answer. I explained to him that I didn't do anything for fun, nothing. I don't really have hobbies. Growing my business is my job and also my hobby. This might sound extreme, but it is the truth. I more or less punted my entire 20s to focus on my business. I sacrificed. When all my friends were out partying when I was very young, I was out on appointments. When people I went to school with were having a great old time, I was in the shadows building my business. I took very few vacations, and when I did, after a few days, I was eager to get back to work. I was obsessive. I believe that if I pay the price today, I will be able to do anything I want in my life later. I have trained myself to be a master of delaying gratification. The closest thing I typically do to going on a vacation is industry conferences. I am always working, always. I wake up in the morning and I have 100 emails already. I usually have 15 to 20 direct messages on Facebook, probably another dozen on LinkedIn. My calendar is full every single day. I work 80 to 100 hours a week all year around, and I've been doing that for many years. My success can be jocked up to one thing more above everything else. I am an unrelenting workaholic. I am sure a shrink would have a field day with me, but it is what it is. People always talk about the big lofty goals that they want to accomplish in this industry. I always wish them well and hope that they do accomplish them, but I also find that many, and I mean many, underestimate the level of work and dedication it takes to win big in the insurance business. I probably take it even too far. I know a few people in our space that are either at my level or farther above my level that, take, that, that give more time for themselves. I'm sure that is healthier. My life has been and will be for some time all about my business and my family. That is it. There is no room for anything else. And that's exactly how I want it to be for the time being. You may be thinking, if you are reading this, the memoirs of a crazy person right now, but 
What I will tell you is to reach my level of success or even levels higher, there are many people who have accomplished more success than me. It takes a lot of work and dedication. Everybody is looking for shortcuts. The easy way, work smarter, not harder, they say. While I agree with this principle and this concept, I would change it to work smarter and harder. Then you can really win. Some people have natural God-given ability in a lot of areas that causes them to be able to float through life with less effort. I certainly am not one of those people. My experience, knowledge, and success have come through my blood, sweat, and tears, period. Everybody I know who I, I would classify as a superstar works or worked for a long time their butt off. It's time to stop trying to find the easy way out. Yes, you should certainly look to improve strategies and do things more efficiently. But it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to take um, the rest of the week off and work 10 hours a week. It means you can free up some time to focus on another area of your business. This doesn't mean that you must neglect your family or other important areas of your life. What you should neglect is watching TV, playing video games, and going to the club on weekends. Most people would be amazed at how much me time they really have. I don't regret all the time I've spent working. It has paid off big for me. To be successful, it takes a level of sacrifice. Are you ready to make that sacrifice? Superstars look at things differently. I've reinforced that several times throughout this book. One thing that they think about is being able to retire in 10 to 15 years if that's what they want. The average retirement age in America is 63. What if you, what if you are 40 today and you want to retire by 50? You have an extra 13 years to do whatever you want with whoever you want whenever you want. Becoming a superstar means you have choices that other people don't have. This path isn't for everybody, but I can tell you this. It does work, and it's well worth it. Chapter 12, Invest in Your Business. Treat your business like a business, and it will pay you like a business. Treat it like a hobby, and it will pay you like a hobby. Far too many agents are treating their businesses like a hobby. If you don't spend money on your business, it is more like a hobby than a business to me. So many people in the insurance industry preach and die on the hill of grassroots marketing and pounding the pavement as well as networking. I think all of these items are great and a good thing to be doing if you're just getting started. However, they are not scalable. There is only so high you can climb if you're unwilling to spend money on your business. To truly grow and maximize your time on income producing activities, you must do the following. Number one, advertise and market. You have to do this. When you are doing this effectively, it can be the best form of spending your money and save yourself time by weeding through all the uninterested candidates and make sure you are only and actively talking to people who actually have an interest in talking to you. Imagine how much more production you can do by just talking to people who are interested in what you have to offer. Grow a team around you. Teamwork definitely makes the dream work. And you simply cannot make a big of an um, impact if you're doing all the customer service work for your existing clients, among many other things in your business. As I said in a previous chapter, acquiring clients trumps retention, but it doesn't mean retention isn't important. You need to stop spending your time on activities that brings clients into the, that doesn't bring clients into the door and start putting your time on income producing activities. Number three, systems. You need a good CRM. You need a good quoting engine. Long term, you need many other systems as you grow. This all costs money. My first four years as an agent, I barely spent any money on my business. It just didn't cross my mind. I was all about pounding the pavement. My growth was slower than it needed to be, and I hit the ceiling. Once I started to spend money on my business, I crashed through that ceiling, and I started to see more opportunity present itself for my growth. The big agencies look at metrics in a way that you might find interesting. There are a few terms that I want you to get familiar with. Number one, cost per acquisition or CPA. This is just like it sounds, the average amount it costs an organization to obtain a new client. It can best be calculated by what is spent on leads and marketing divided by the number of new clients that are brought in over the same period of time. Many newer agency owners, including myself included, often make the mistake thinking that the lower this number is, the better. That would make logical sense, right? Well, maybe not. Someone that does nothing 
but Doorknock will have a very low CPA. They aren't spending any money. It's all sweat equity. It doesn't mean that they are bringing clients in as frequently as an agent down the street who's running a TV ad for the same product. If the door-to-door agent CPA is zero and the agent on the TV ad who has clients call his office and enroll pays $200, who is better off? Not the door knocker. The TV ad agent is likely outproducing him by a lot in his nice, cool, air-conditioned office. What if I told you that many large call centers have CPAs that are close to $400 per client? Maybe even more for some. Well, that wouldn't make any sense, you might say. It will when you hear the next term. Number two, lifetime value of a client. This is how large organizations view profit. They are looking at the average lifetime value of a client when they obtain them. They don't do what most single agents do and count just the first year commission. They may if they're working with a line of insurance that isn't renewal heavy, but let's say they're looking at a Medicare supplement. They may determine that the average Medicare supplement client will stay on the books for an average of five years. Let's also say that they make about $300 in first year commission or yearly commission on that client. In their eyes and their metrics, they look at it like they just made $1,500 on that new client they just obtained. So when you look at it that way, a CPA of $400 is more than warranted. Think about any successful business you have ever heard of. I guarantee you that they spend more money on their business than you can imagine. Growth is expensive. Superstars continue to find ways and to overcome obstacles once they hit a wall. You can grow for a while as a one-man show, and you can grow for a while with all effort-based client obtainment strategies, but it will only last for so long. At the time of writing this book, this is what my company is investing in when it comes to our marketing and advertising. This will give you some real inside information that hopefully helps you get an idea of where you should be focusing. Branded direct mail. Typically generic direct mail pieces just aren't working like they used to. Years ago, you could work with a vendor and expect a 2 to 3% response rate in direct mail leads. This was incredibly profitable. This has shrunk down to less than 1% and oftentimes less than 0.5% or half a percent in many cases. Branded direct mail has been much more effective than generic, but even still, this is not enough. You should also be sending multiple pieces of mail to each recipient in the form of a drip campaign. This is what we've been doing the last couple of years, but we've ramped it up heavily over the past few. This means that you have a strategy on when these pieces will go out. Why is this important and why the change in direct mail? It's simple, really. More people are mailing than ever. This is causing return rates to plummet. The more mail somebody gets, the easier it is for your mailer to get lost in the shuffle. Branded Facebook advertising. I love running ads with video of me talking. I have had much better results myself doing this than showing a picture. I push traffic to a landing page that either creates a call to action to call into my office or they fill out their information on a landing page. With Facebook ads and many types of online advertising, you can retarget the people who see your ad but don't take the next step. It is very cost effective once you know what you are doing, but it has gotten more technical over the years. Billboards. Billboards by themselves, in my opinion, do not drive traffic to your business. They may if you have many of them all over town, but if you have just a few, not so much. It doesn't mean that they don't have value. What a billboard does is reinforce other types of advertising you're doing through branding and repetition. Hey, I've seen that before. Telemarketing. I'm a big fan of having telemarketers call for you. Someone oversees that works for a reduced rate to make calls and find people who are interested in what you offer. This way, you are only talking to the most interested prospective customers. You can either hire one on your own through different web searches, or you can work with a company who can plug you into an established one. Seminars. We are starting to do more seminars at the time of writing this, and I think for many types of insurance, this is very lucrative. You can advertise them via direct mail and Facebook advertising. Some of the seminar-specific organizations even do this for you, and they know the most effective keys to hit on. This is very, very new to us, and we haven't done a lot with it over the years, but it is very promising and efficient, 
as you can talk to a lot of people in a group all at the same time. We still buy leads as fillers from time to time. Leads are the lifeline of your business. It is all about having enough people to talk to on a routine basis to have enough revenue rolling in. Parting with some of that money can expedite how many people you can talk to in a speedy manner. Chapter 13, Stop Worrying About Competition. I used to be so worried about all the other agents in my market around me. I have vivid memories of going into a coffee shop or a restaurant and seeing a competitor's agent's cards up on a bulletin board. I would always tear them down when nobody was looking, hoping I was gaining an edge on them. This was so stupid and misguided of me. I would also badmouth other agents during appointments if I found out that the potential client had an agent at the time or they had been talking to another agent at the same time as me. I am sure this just made me come across poorly and look like an ass more than anything else. I remember one instance where I just told one poor lady that her current agent had flat out screwed her over. She was horrified at my behavior and did not end up doing business with me. I can't say that I blame her. When you are worried about your competitors, you're thinking about them instead of thinking about you and your business and how you can make it better. You also are thinking about how to one-up your competitor in a meeting with a potential client more than you're thinking about the business and doing a great job for that potential client. That is where your focus should be 24-7. You are only in competition with yourself. This doesn't mean that you don't want to pay some attention to what other people are doing in order to keep an eye on market trends, but other agents are not a threat to you. One thing I learned years ago is that 9 out of 10 agents don't take their business or their profession seriously. They just don't. They have other jobs, do it seasonally, or get complacent and are asleep at the wheel. Just by you showing up every day and being consistent like you are, you're going to win against those 9 out of 10 agents. For the remaining 1 out of 10 that are like you and that are taking their future and career seriously, there is plenty of business to go around, and I mean plenty. I used to be a recluse, and I would never attend anything to do with agents because I felt like me getting around them was giving them a leg up on how to put me out of business. You could call me paranoid if you would. One of the best things I have done for my own health and my own career is choosing to live with a view of abundance. The insurance industry is a big one, and there is plenty to go around. You are so much better off going to industry events and collaborating with other people to gain ideas for areas that you can do better in your business. You can share notes on what's working or maybe what's not working. A rising tide lifts all ships. Since you are in competition with yourself more than anybody else, you should be focused on dominating more than you are focused on competing. If you were the only person in the world that did what you did and you had no competition, what would you do? You would go for it and try to get all the marbles. My advice to you would be to proceed as if you had no competition and with the mentality of domination. Now watch how you grow. Chapter 14, Climb and Help Others. As we come to the end of our journey together, I hope that you have a new sense of purpose. Sometimes becoming massively successful is not easy, and it certainly isn't always sexy. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication, but it is certainly worth it if you have a big appetite for success. I would like to close this final chapter by telling you a very personal story about myself. As I men I've mentioned throughout my the book here, I did nothing but sell on a very low profile basis for the first six years of my career. I did not contract any agents and I did not collaborate with any agents. By the time I was 25 years old, I was making a six figure income in renewals and it only climbed from there as I grew. I had already been a top producer for multiple carriers by that point. This business can be extremely lonely and I was very lonely for a long time. I decided that I wanted to shift my focus to working with agents and trying to help them have a, the same kind of success that I had in, as an individual producer. I've gotten so much joy and fulfillment from helping other agents all over the country become top earners, top producers, and financially free. I have coached and mentored probably a thousand plus agents in some form or fashion to this point, and it has been a great experience for me. Nothing brings me more joy than an agent I coached emailing or texting me to tell me that they have completely turned their business around and are beginning to catch fire. Nothing is a better feeling for me. 
I sold insurance myself for a long time, and it was great while it lasted, but now I have a different focus and purpose. It doesn't mean that my agency doesn't take on new clients, but others in our organization are the ones, for the most part, writing these policies instead of me. I have a different role. In every line of work, you have those who stand out above everybody else, and they shine. You see it in sports, entertainment, investing, politics, war, and yes, business of all kinds. Many of the traits listed in this book will be traits that you see in top performers across the board. Superstars are willing to do the things and the little things that nobody else is, and that is why they shine so brightly. Superstars can make it look effortless. I often feel that way when I watch a great athlete who can do amazing things on the court or on the field. The same rings true to our world. Superstar agents are truly machines. They pump out production in a few weeks that other agents don't do in a quarter, and for some, an entire year. This is everybody's goal when they come into our industry, but once they find out what is required to get there, it becomes empty words for many. It's a combination of hard work, discipline, strategy, courage, and belief that it will pay off. I say all of this to encourage you, once you have made it and become successful, help others become successful also. I know so many agents in the industry that are worth seven and eight figures and keep all of their knowledge to themselves and just share what they want the people to know, or maybe they only share with a select few. That is just a shame, and I hope once you break through and become a superstar that you double down on your work in helping others become superstars themselves. That is what I would call a legacy. Christian's favorite YouTube channels. Number one, the Christian Brindle channel, of course. Number two, the Grant Cardone channel. Number three, Gary Vaynerchuk. Number four, Valuetainment. Number five, Financial Education. Number six, Graham Stephan. Number seven, the Charisma Matrix. Number eight, Ty Lopez. Number nine, Lewis Howes. Number 10, the Meet Kevin channel. Christian's current favorite automation tools. Number one, Go High Level. This system is immensely cool. It can work as either a CRM or as a lead flow follow-up machine. You can either get it on your own or you can license it through somebody else. It allows you to communicate with people on an automation format via email campaigns, text messages, and pre-recorded voicemails. It definitely helps you reach people in a much faster and greater fashion without you having to do all the actual work yourself. Number two, thanks.io. This is an automated postcard service we currently use to send out to all of our clients automated birthday cards, thank you letters, and others. Number three, Mailbox Power. This is also an automated mailing service, but I like it more for marketing. It can send out drip campaigns that I was mentioning previously in the book, but, I can, but it can do so many things on a timer. It is typically much less expensive than using a vendor or a mail house. Contact our office for more information on Christian's mini automation course that walks you through how to use all three of these platforms. About the author. Christian Brindle is an insurance sales expert, agency owner, YouTuber, podcaster, author, founder of the Six Figure Medicare Agent Facebook group, and the creator of the Six Figure Medicare Agent Summit. By the age of 20, Christian started working as an insurance agent selling Medicare-related products. By the time he was 27, he was making multiple six figures and had been a top producer for six different insurance companies. Christian has spoken on many industry event stages, mentored agents all over the country, and has helped create top producers far and wide through his marketing promotion and sales strategies and tactics. Medicare agents, make sure you get into Six Figure Medicare University. Six Figure Medicare University is Christian's online training platform that he uses to train his agents on the Medicare side. It is constantly updated and includes hundreds of training videos on building a successful agency. Hundreds have been through it, and the results are staggering. Connect with us via Six Figure Medicare Agents Facebook group and mention you read the book for an exclusive 25% discount from the normal retail price for lifetime access.